Okay, so because growth hormone uh, has become, uh, well, because it's been abused so much over the last few years, it has pretty much come center stage in controversy. And because of that, physicians uh, need to be very careful about uh, who they prescribe growth hormone for. Federal law treats growth hormone differently than other, other uh, scheduled drugs, controlled drugs. Growth hormone falls under the FDA uh, scrutiny. FDA uh, is the one that controls and oversees the use of growth hormone, not the DEA. Since 2009, last year, about April or May, the uh, pharmaceutical companies changed the language in their package insert. They used to say that they would recommend a provocative stimulation test to diagnose growth hormone deficiency. Now they say that it's required, must be confirmed. This has really changed things in the, in the eyes of Synogenics as to how we go about diagnosing growth hormone deficiency. And they specifically say that it cannot be used for anti-aging purposes or for the for purposes of building muscle or for athletic uh, enhancement of athletic performance. <clears throat> so Synogenics, uh, because we're a large corporation, decided to err on the side of caution. And so we have decided that we want to when we initially see our patients and we think they're growth hormone deficient based on blood levels and based on all the other things that go along with growth hormone deficiency, which I'll be talking about, if we think they're growth hormone deficient, we wait for two months. We, we correct all their other hormonal deficiencies. We fix their nutritionals, get them on the right nutrition, get them on the right exercise, and then we repeat blood work again in two months most people will increase their own production of growth hormone. It's pretty dramatic, really. But there are some that will not, and those are the people that we think we need to test, do a provocative stimulation test before we treat them with growth hormone. So we only initiate growth hormone therapy if they fail a stimulation test. This is a very conservative, very safe approach. I've created the, the growth hormone guidelines and uh, it summarizes the science and this is really pretty much what I'm talking about today. And uh, we, I discussed the role of growth hormone in medical practice and it's really not intended to establish a standard of care for growth hormone treatment. I think each physician has to make up their own mind about each patient and decide whether uh, they really will benefit from growth hormone or not. And, the, and they need to decide if they want to go ahead and do the provocative testing, which I will discuss later. So the Endocrinology Society has described growth hormone deficiency as decreased energy levels, social isolation, lack of positive well-being, depressed mood, increased anxiety, increased body fat, especially central adiposity or visceral fat, decreased muscle mass, decreasing bone density, increased LDL cholesterol and ApoB, decreased HDL cholesterol, decre decreased cardiac muscle mass, impaired cardiac function that was just discussed, decreased total and extracellular fluid volume, decreased insulin sensitivity and increased prevalence for impaired glucose tolerance, increased concentration of plasma fibrinogen and plasminogen, accelerated atherogenesis. These are all very bad things, as you know. And, and, and these, all these metabolic changes that I just described increase the risk of, of uh, atheromatous cardiovascular disease. And we see this in patients that are hypopituitary, and we see it in patients that are low in IGF-1. The, 
Up until 1986, growth hormone was harvested from cadavers. So at that time, a lot of thought had to go into who to put on growth hormone. So they, they, they devised this growth hormone stimulation test, uh, which is a provocative test that stimulates the pituitary to produce growth hormone. And at the time, insulin stimulation was the, the test that was used the most by endocrinologists. But since 1986, growth hormone has become commercially available and with a recombinant gene technology that we use for insulin. And so all these issues surrounding the transmission of disease from cadavers is gone as of the creation of, these, of this new growth hormone, recombinant gene growth hormone. So the stimulation test, with, as I said, was used mostly by endocrinologists. But there are a lot of dangers with the in insulin tolerance test. Insulin tolerance, as you can well imagine, you give someone insulin and they, their blood sugars plummet. The whole idea is to drop blood sugars, which stimulates the pituitary to produce more growth hormone. But you can have seizures. You can have unconsciousness. It's contraindicated in anyone with coronary artery disease. And that could be uh, obvious coronary artery disease or occult coronary artery, artery disease, or anyone with seizures. Murray and his group described all growth hormone stimulation tests as plagued by poor reproducibility and labor intensive. And they feel that there's very little data to support the use of all provocative stimulation tests. And there's a, there, there, over the last three or four years, there's been gr more and more growing criticism about the use of the insulin tolerance test. And I have references here. There are a ton of references of what I gave you. These references uh, cover just about everything uh, that's uh, happened over the last 15 years with growth hormone. There are several recent studies that have demonstrated the clinical usefulness of growth hormone supplementation without the insulin tolerance test or without requiring that someone fail it. And now there are several researchers that feel IGF-1 is a more reliable diagnostic and therapeutic marker of growth hormone deficiency. There are one, two, three, four, five references right there. These are all new within the last few years. The society, the Growth Hormone Research Society, concluded that in association with appropriate clinical signs and symptoms, and in conjunction with proper laboratory evaluation, you can diagnose growth hormone deficiency in the absence of the insulin tolerance test. In spite of that, the FDA has maintained their position that the ITT, or that a provocative test, must be done before you can diagnose someone as being having adult growth hormone deficiency. One of the biggest proponents of this is an academician named Tom Pearls from Boston. Tom is a zealot when it comes to going after people that use growth, that prescribe growth hormone for what he considers to be anti-aging. And he has had an impact on Congress and on the AMA to get them to think in terms of requiring provocative testing to diagnose growth hormone deficiency before you prescribe growth hormone. The Growth Hormone Research Society also points out that the people can have normal IGF-1s, including Williams' textbook of endocrinology, and still be deficient in growth hormone. Let's talk about growth hormone and health. As, as, as in all disease states, as you know, there are varying degrees of severity. And there is mounting evidence that adults with growth hormone deficiency or, in, or, or insufficiency have health, impaired health, and would benefit tremendously from growth hormone replacement therapy. This, this study maintains that IGF-1 levels at the mean or one standard deviation, actually between one and two standard deviations, are necessary to maintain optimal health. If you maintain IGF-1 levels in this range, 
you, you improve overall health. McGurkey and her associates looked at it differently. They, they looked at what, what were the IGF-1 levels that were associated with good health. And this, she found that if people were within one to two standard deviations above the mean, that's when optimal health was achieved. If they were at the mean, they began to have not so optimal health. And as, as they dropped below the mean, their health worsened. 